love having a dance break. Dance breaks all the time. <laughs> We're going to have to turn the cameras on for that. <laughs> <laughs> My camera is broken. I can't. Lies. Lies. <laughs> Hi, Disha. Hey, Donnie. And welcome, everyone, to Ursa Short Fiction, the podcast where we geek out on our favorite short stories. I'm Donnie Walton, author of The Final Revival of Opal and Nev. And I'm Disha Filia, author of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. And as always, this show is produced with support from you. Become an Ursa member today by going to ursastory.com slash join. You'll get exclusive bonus episodes, and you'll help fund future stories and conversations like today's. We are so excited to have a guest who's been at the top of our list since we first started talking about launching this podcast, Nafisa Thompson Spires, author of Heads of the Colored People. So, Disha, I first met Nafisa in 2017. We were at the Tin House Summer Workshop together. Uh, this was mm-hmm. just before Heads came out. And we were both in Matt Johnson's novel workshop. Mm-hmm. Shout out Shout out to Matt Johnson. Matt Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I like to imagine him in the audience listening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, I was blown away by Nafisa's work. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that class, she put up an excerpt from something she was working on that featured uh, Fatima, who is a character that appears in different iterations Mm -hmm. through several of the stories in Heads of the Colored People. And what I loved about Nafisa's work is that it embraces so many things that I love in fiction. There's humor, there's Mm -hmm. pop culture, there's that juicy pettiness that the characters display (laughs) (laughs) that keeps me turning the pages. And at the same time that her work is funny and fleet, it's also very cerebral, right? It's very Mm -hmm. geeky. It's very willing to dive deep into whatever environment her characters are in. And that could be academia. It could be reality TV. It could be cosplay. It's just so rich and wonderful. And I love it. Absolutely. And so on the flip side, I met her just after Heads came out. And I remember reading an article and it was like, you know, black geeks, you know, celebrate, unite or something. And it was sort of like her book as as the, you know, the black geek collection we'd all been waiting for. Right. And um, and I love in addition to just, you know, loving Nafisa and her work, um, you know, myself as a reader, also as a writer and just, you know, admiring everything she's doing on the page. um, I love teaching her work. Yeah. And, you know, one of the the blessings of her work is having students have an aha moment around, wait a minute, I can write about Comic Con. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can write about petty black mothers, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um I can write about social media. Um, you know, the things that are important to them and that they enjoy. And as you said, you know, there's the cerebral quality, but it feels like so much fun and play on the page. And the students come away from Nafisa's work with so much of a sense of possibility for their own work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so excited. We even talk in this conversation a little bit about what she's working on now, which I cannot wait to get my hands on it. I know you've read some of it. And, yes. Um, students Ooh. of the world, rid choice. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit more about Nafisa. She earned a PhD in English from Vanderbilt University and an MFA in creative writing from the University of Illinois. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review Daily, The Cut, The Root, Plowshares, 400 Souls, and the 1619 Project, among other publications. And she's currently the Richards Family Assistant Professor of Creative Writing at Cornell University. It's a wonderful conversation, and we're excited for you to get into it. So without further ado, here is our interview with Nafisa Thompson Spires. Nafisa Thompson Spires, we Hello. are thrilled to have you on the Ursa podcast. How are you? I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm great. How are you all? Oh, good. 
Good, good, good. So excited to like dig into this stunning collection that I honestly feel like was written just for me. <laughs> in so many the ways. rest of us were just allowed to read I just, it. Right? I know. It was like the book for Donnie. Like, it was just like, I feel so connected to so many of the stories in different ways. We're going to get into all of that. I think first we just wanted to ask you how this collection came to be, the publishing backstory, you know, when you first started writing stories, when you knew you had a collection, all that good, inspiring stuff. Well, it's kind of a story that I think encapsulates my personality. I was supposed to be writing a different book and I wrote this one instead. So (laughs) um, I had gotten a revise and resubmit from an agent on a YA novel I was actually working on. And I had queried that novel so much. It was the book I was workshopping in my MFA program. And I was getting pretty good feedback on that book. But I had queried maybe like 100 times on this book, um, the YA novel, which was called Akimbobo. And it was about an Afrocentric summer camp for Black troubled children where some really interesting stuff was going down and problematic behavioral techniques. And he wanted me to change the ages of the characters to make them um, a little younger. And I didn't feel comfortable with that. And Mm. instead of working on that book, I was like, I'm going to write something else in my spare time. And I wrote Heads. And I wrote it Mm. really, really quickly, actually. And a nice colleague at my university, University of Illinois, Jensen Beach, I saw him at AWP and he said to me, um, you need an agent who actually cares about short stories. And my agent does. And he put me in touch with her and I queried a couple of other agents. I only queried like three this time for that book and it sold at auction. And it was a very, very quick process this time. It was like from February to, I think it sold by September, the querying to the revision to the auction was like a February to September situation. Wow. So it was very, very, very quick. Thank God. Wow. Gosh. And so did you start like the first story you started writing around then, or had you had something already and you kind of put it together? No, the first story I wrote was actually in January. Wow. Um, And this was all 2015, 2016. And I wrote Heads of the Colored People, the story, and I realized that it could anchor a collection perhaps. And that story I submitted to Story Quarterly's contest, and Matt Johnson was the judge, and I knew Matt Johnson (laughs) probably would like a story about people who are into comic books and anime. And so when I found out he was the judge, I was like, I'm going to send this story to this competition specifically with this judge in mind. And then I had him as my workshop teacher at Tin House. And he didn't know that I was the same person whose contest he had just judged. Wow. And I was like, do you remember me and my work? Um, the book is actually in revisions right now with an oh agent. That was the summer. And he was like, oh my gosh, I thought there were two of these stories, but I'm really glad to know that it's you. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it was just um, that story I thought could anchor a collection and I started writing toward the themes of that story and realized, oh, I can write these pretty fast. And so from January to around March between the first story winning the contest and going to AWP, I realized I could probably put a collection together relatively quickly because I had some other stories that were just sort of sitting around and it came together. Mm -hmm. So Wow. It was, yeah, that's not how it's going for my second book, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> when I first read the collection, I was just dazzled and blown away by so many things. Of course, you know, from a craft perspective, all of the things you were doing on the page, playing with form and just at the sentence level, the ingeniousness of the stories, the humor um, and the stories that are funny and the emotional gut punches for the stories that aren't haha funny. And I want to talk about one of those later, but the the freshness and the originality, all of it. And I remember um, it came on my radar because of a Guardian article about heads. And it said something like black nerds finally get their literary due. And that was enough for me to want to check it out. The book is so much more than a gift to black nerds, which it is. um, But it's the total package. And I had never read stories like these before. And so I'm curious which writers um, have influenced you and your work and in heads particularly. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for saying all that. That's really kind. Um, So many from the black literary traditions, a lot of the writers who Mark Anthony Neal and other people call the post-soul writers 
Um, mm-hmm. So it's really people specifically like Matt Johnson and Victor Laval and um, to some extent Paul Beatty. And then on the other side, people like Shirley Jackson and Flannery O'Connor who write that Southern Gothicism. I'm really into mm-hmm. some styles of literary horror and people who write quick punchy endings I think I'm really into the gut punch I like to talk to Mm -hmm. my students about three kinds of literary endings that I think are specifically useful and they're the gut punch the punchline and beautiful lyricism and I'm not so great at the beautiful lyricism but I think I am good at a gut punch and a Mm -hmm. punchline and those two for me are really prevalent in Jackson and in O'Connor and so they definitely influence my endings but the black literary tradition of you know, also George Schuyler to many degrees and Ishmael Reed, um, people who play with form, who play with tone, who play with lots of shifts and structure and who you can tell are having a fun time while they're writing and yeah. who are trying to disarm you at every point. Those are my, that's my jam. Those are my people. So all of them to some degree have really influenced me and made me feel like I could take some liberties in what I was doing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. had permission I definitely need to take your class on endings because that is my struggle. And I love sort of that that breakdown. And I do want to talk about um, the ending of one of the stories. But first, okay. so speaking of Matt Johnson, that's where I first met you because we were in that workshop together and it was Mm -hmm. magical and life changing. And one of the reasons that it was was because in that workshop, I was first introduced to Fatima, your character, Fatima who sort of anchors a, I'm going to call it the Fatima trilogy in this, in this <laughs> book. Um, we see her first from a distance in Belle Lettre um, through the escalating letters between her mom and Christinia's mom. And then we see her as an adult in the body's defenses against itself. And at that point, she's struggling with her body and her competitive reaction to another Black woman in the hot yoga class. And then Finally, the last story, which I think was the one that was like a gut punch for me, um, in Fatima the Biloquist, um, we see her in sort of a transitional teenage period where she's doing something that felt very familiar to me from my teenage years, which was sort of compartmentalizing her her identity in, in strange and painful ways. I'm so curious to hear about the evolution of this character um, as you wrote deeper into her and how these three different phases of her life kind of came to you and came together for this collection. Yeah, she's a really interesting person. Um, She's definitely troubled by her white private school upbringing and For full disclosure, she's the most autobiographical character in the collection. Mm -hmm. So she's dealing with a lot of body image and then physical ailments. She has endometriosis. She has some symptoms of PCOS. So she's struggling with trying to find her place in this school where she has been an outcast. And the crabs in a barrel mentality where her sort of enemy, Christinia, is the only other black girl in the grade. And then their two mothers have been feuding with each other. So it was interesting to try to figure out the best order for those stories. And it made sense ultimately to put them in chronological order so that you could see Fatima or Fatima kind of grow up over time in the collection. With Belletra, that story was inspired by something my mom actually did to me, which was (gasps) feud with my childhood bully my entire grade (laughs) school life. And um, she sent me a packet, which she called a care package, Um, at some point when I was an adult, maybe like seven years ago or six years ago. And it was a box of a bunch of basically crap from my childhood. It had report cards in it. It had all kinds of stuff in it. But one of the things in it was one of the letters from that bully's mother (gasps) to her. And it said, Nafisa is a monster. Nafisa is a terrible child. She's a brat. My daughter is actually a (laughs) wonderful person. And we think you are the problem. And I was like, Mom, I'm going to get you back for this. I'm one day going to write a story about what you did to me. And why weren't there any cookies in this care package? Like, regular mothers send other things in what they call a care package. You sent me a bunch of stuff saying that I was basically a maladapted child. So, um, oh my God. that story came from that. <laughs> Talk about (laughs) making lemonade, my lord. (laughs) I did. I I tried to make some lemonade, but I think there is not enough sugar in it, if we're being honest. (laughs) Let me tell you, every time I read that story, I gasp at various Mm -hmm. points. I'm just like, I can't. 
cannot believe she just wrote that. And there's so many little lines and little, you know, Mm -hmm. the use of the credentials and wielding them like (laughs) weapons. I'm like, oh, my God. So I imagine that this was a very fun story to write. It was so much fun. It's still fun to this day because my mom still doesn't like this girl's mother. And they live within enough proximity to each other that she will still say something like, I saw her at pavilions and she did not look good. She's not aging well, you know? Mm. Um, (laughs) So it's hilarious to me. It feels good to know that it feels like we won over those that family at some level. And I hope that they will never listen to this, though they might, because they're nosy. But um yeah, wow. so that's where that story came from. And then um, Fatima the Bilequist came from, I was reading a lot of Charles Brockton Brown in grad school, and I really liked the way that he played with names. Everyone in some of those books has a name that starts with the letter M or the letter J, and he's just really playful, and so I was inspired by that. But I was also interested in revisiting some more traumatic moments from my childhood and fictionalizing them in the best ways I could. And that story used to have a different name. It was called Smells Like Teen, comma, Spirit. And it was about an incident that happened to me on a school bus. And I decided to fictionalize it a lot more and deal with some other aspects of sort of like double talking or talking on the side of your mouth. And mm-hmm. so it ended up in this version. And I think I'm happier with its ultimate revision. Yeah. And that's the that's the ending I actually wanted to talk about, um, where um, Fatima... Uh, her black friend, Violet, who has albinism, finally meets her white boyfriend, Rolf. It's not a planned meeting. It's sort of a moment that Fatima has been dreading. And when I was reading it, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, there's such a potential to take this ending in sort of a comedic direction. And I think there's a, a little bit of that, but I really felt so much pain and I felt Fatima's shame for how she's hurt her friend um, because Rolf spoiler alert, ends up saying some really awful things to Violet. Can you talk about crafting the ending of that story, the gut punch there, and why this one felt right to close out this section for the character Fatima? Yeah, um, I was really playing with this idea that Fatima was a colorless, odorless gas until a certain point in her life that she felt like she'd existed in a sort of post-raciality, even though very much in the 90s that wasn't a term that we used, and that Ralph is what helps her understand her place in the world as a Black adolescent. And it isn't until he overly racializes Violet, who is living with albinism and doesn't quite look phenotypically Black to other people at first glance, that Fatima realizes her own sense of Blackness. And so that idea that she feels like a vapor or a puff of smoke, but Black smoke felt like just the right ending. It didn't feel right to end that story with heavy humor. It felt right Mm -hmm. to end it with sort of an ironic situational irony and sentence level irony more than anything. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where that came from. It's, It's feeling more racialized through the lens of someone else's racialization, if that makes sense. Yeah, I loved it. I thought it was just perfect. Well, thank you. Yeah. Donnie had mentioned that um, she felt like the stories were written just for her. And that makes me wonder, did you have a particular audience in mind um, as you were writing? Or are you a writer who doesn't think about audience while you're writing? No, it's interesting. I think that we definitely have to think about audience at some point, especially in the revision process and definitely in the marketing process. But while I'm in the drafting generative stage, I really do think mostly about myself. I was a really lonely kid who was a total nerd who had way more book friends than human friends. And so I'm always thinking about that little lonely girl who read all night in bed with insomnia, (laughs) whose books were my closest entities. You know, I, I loved Judy Bloom. I loved so many things. And I took those books with me everywhere. I would bring my books to school and read them aloud to people like, listen to this passage. You've got to listen to this passage. And I would just perform passages on demand. And I think about writing for those people. Like Mm -hmm. if I could just entertain someone or keep someone up at night who is lonely or who can't sleep or has insomnia, then I feel like I've reached my destiny or I've, I've met my purpose in life. So I'm not thinking so much about a specific person, but I'm thinking about 
a figure who was like the figure I was when I was younger, who just needs company. And mm-hmm. if I can reach that person's loneliness, then I feel like I will have made a difference in the world. In the marketing, though, we were thinking a lot about shaping it around a certain kind of Black reader in particular who needed to see these characters. And mm-hmm. so both things were on my mind at the same time, especially when it came to the revision process. Mm-hmm. And see, that's why it's not strange. I mean, the, the Guardian took the angle they took that, you know, it, there's so much in the collection that's not sort of a Black nerd fest, right? And I think it's almost like they read the first story and then extrapolate it from there. But I think about a story like Wash Clean the Bones, if I were imagining, you know, demographics for different stories, like this one, to me, it's such a haunting story about, uh, for those who haven't read it, um, about a grieving young mother. And there's a particularly um, terrifying moment in the story. And that one sort of stood out to me um, from the, among the other stories. Um, and it seems like there was a different demographic in mind there. Am I picking up on something that's different about this story than the others? Oh, yeah. That story is, I think, the most haunting, even though it it begins with police brutality, the collection with heads of the colored people, the titular story. Mm -hmm. It ends also with brutality. It it ends with a mother who is so afraid of, and this is a slight spoiler, but it's not totally a spoiler, a mother who is so afraid of her black son's position in the world. And she's labored intensely and gone through IVF and all kinds of things to have this child um, that she considers stifling his life to protect him from the world at large and from white supremacy. So it's a totally different tone. It's a tonal shift Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways from the other stories in the collection, which are much more humorous and Mm -hmm. playful in their tone. And this is the only story that doesn't use any humor or satire whatsoever. And I wouldn't call that story a story about black nerds in any way, shape or form. It's a story about just humanity and pure Mm -hmm. terror and the terror of living as a black person in the United States which is what I think the collection at its heart is about in a lot of ways. It's about Mm -hmm. grappling with being Black in a world that constantly gaslights you. So I'm curious then if when you saw, if you saw that Guardian article, I keep referencing and assuming you saw it. I did see it. Yeah. I came to my house for a photo shoot. So okay. Yeah. I I think that it it represents some aspects of the collection and that it's a kind of punchy, saucy way to sell it to some people. Right. Um, I don't think it represents it in its total fullness. So I, I really hear what you're saying, Disha, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it got me to read it, you know, and I was just, you know, I, was, I knew I was going to en- enjoy it just based on the premise of what I read in the article. Um, and then as I got deeper and deeper into the collection, I was like, oh, there's a lot more here. There's a lot. The mother daughter themes, which resonate with me a lot, the grief, so much more that was there than I had anticipated having this conversation with you now and gave us, gave me an opportunity to revisit the stories, you know, this time knowing what they were. And so it was a different reading experience. And I found myself feeling much more emotional this time than Mm -hmm. the first time that I read it. And and I'm curious about um, the emotional journey for you. um, Now that I heard you say that, you know, so many of the stories are, are autobiographical in some ways, how did you manage kind of revisiting some of these moments from your past that were obviously painful? That's an interesting question. You know, I think in the moment writing them, I never say that writing is therapeutic because it's not. I think therapy is therapy and writing is writing. Mm -hmm. Um, And that you need both Mm -hmm. for sure. I think writing can often be catharsis, but it isn't true catharsis because I write for different reasons than that. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I write because I need to, I write because I'm compelled to, I write because it's part of my purpose. And I write more for expository reasons to expose things that are going on in the world and to shame people for doing them. Um, Yes. But I do think that writing them helped me work out some things because I I wrote to disarm people. I wrote Mm -hmm. to put some people on display who had harmed me. And so it actually, I feel better about all of those moments in childhood and and having written them. And I had already worked a lot of that stuff out in therapy and I'm still working some of it out in therapy. So I I don't feel exposed by it. I actually have a lot of fun talking about the autobiographical elements. Mm. Wash Clean the Bones was the hardest one to write though. It, It was definitely a very difficult story because it's a departure from what I usually do. Mm -hmm. I think it's helping to prepare me for the novel I'm writing, which is very, very dark, but Mm -hmm. it is dark, darkly humorous. So I think it, it prepped me for some of the work, the groundwork that I've had to do for this new project. 
Mm. Is there anything you can share about that? Not, you don't have to, but just, you know, I hear a new project and I'm like, Ooh, (laughs) well, it is also somewhat autobiographical in that it's a family story. Um, it deals with my great grandfather who I misheard when my mom was telling me about him. I thought he was a polygamist. He was actually just married four times, but I thought he was married to all four people at the same time. (laughs) And so (laughs) I ran with that and (laughs) I'm like, I don't want to hear any more information, but he was married to two women who were first cousins and he had 40 kids and he beat them all with a horse whip. And I was like, that's plenty of information for me. Got an awful lot of it. So right now in the draft, it's called how to commit patricide. And all I can say is that it is a dark murder mystery with a lot of humor in it. (laughs) Wow. That sounds incredible. And a little scary and (laughs) darkly funny. (laughs) But turning to the light side for a minute. So, you know, pop culture is my jam. Like anytime (laughs) literary work has pop culture references, I am all about it. And this collection has everything from Patty Mayonnaise, from Dove, <laughs> to like, there's a reference to the swooping Aaliyah bangs, which I can see in my head right now, and Degrassi, of course, which I think we have bonded over before. <laughs> yes, absolutely, so, Degrassi. How does pop culture fuel your work? Um, and then I want to ask you also what you're obsessed with right now, pop culture wise. Oh, I can't wait to tell you what I'm obsessed with. So, I have to say, I did a PhD in English before I did an MFA, three years before I did an MFA, and I was a pop culturalist. I studied television, and my dissertation was all about television and how pop culture affects our understanding of the world, and especially international television in the United States. So my dissertation was actually on the low key about Degrassi. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Can and you Degrassi's send that to me? impact on us. I sure can, Donnie. Yes. I absolutely I can. That. Okay, okay. So I got away with writing an entire doctoral dissertation about Baby Drake, and <laughs> I find any way I possibly can to work television and music into my work. Because it's the world we live in. It's the world we inhabit. And I think that it's a huge part of anyone's life. And I also just love illusion. So there's not just, um, you know, references to television and film and popular culture, but there's references to other texts. This whole book is intertextual in that, you know, the title comes from an original book by James McCune Smith, which was a um, selection of sketches that were called the original The Heads of the Colored People Done with a Whitewash Brush. James McCune Smith was an abolitionist and doctor who was writing all of these literary sketches in the 19th century, trying to theorize what it would look like for Black people to have the full rights of citizenship back then. And my book is a response to that. So mm-hmm. it's already in conversation with lots of texts, and it made sense for me to be in con- conversation constantly with other literary texts. It's also in conversation with Frances Ellen Harper's work, who was another abolitionist and poet in the 19th century. It's in conversation with just a lot of other people. And I can't write without that. I I was listening to Solmaz Sharif recently and listening to another writer, um, Sandeep Parvu, and she was saying literature comes from other literature. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good Mm -hmm. point. You can't write text without text. And I personally cannot write without writing. I have to read and write in conversation with other people. Mm -hmm. And I I find writing to be a conversation at all times. It's just, it's how I communicate. And so I, I can't do anything that's not intertextual. I just can't. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because that just adds so many layers and so many discoveries. And I, I love the references. And I am so excited to hear about your um, dissertation. I also want to see it because I was not the original Degrassi demographic, but my kids <laughs> introduced me to, Demo- uh. to Degrassi like in the last five years. So I have a different lens on the show. So I can't wait to, to read your, your work. Now, okay. Does the dissertation cover like from all the way back from original Degrassi all the way through like the new, all the new spinoffs and, and all of that? It does. It goes from 79 uh, when it started uh, to 2009, which is when I defended. Oh my God. So, I'm salivating. I'm salivating. So Disha, there's Degrassi for you too from the 70s on. You don't have to see, deal with I, the, the new baby kids. 
well, all I've watched are the Drake years. That's what my kids and I are still in the process of watching. Like we'll sit and binge it like for hours at a time. I so approve of I got to catch up. Yes. <laughs> Aren't I a good parent? Isn't that like a, like you a are. parenting gold star? <laughs> amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, I, I love Nafisa what you were saying about how all of these things are part of our world and relevant to our world. And mm-hmm. thus, like they really feel like they belong in your work because I, I too, you know, draw on pop culture in my work as well. And I do, you know, feel like I've gotten comments in workshop before, like, yeah, I don't know, like maybe it's going to feel dated or whatever. And I'm just like, why should I worry about that now? Like I'm writing in this moment in this time. Exactly. Every, and people can yeah. look things up. We have more. Right. We don't just have Encyclopedia Britannica anymore. We have way more options for looking things up. And I'd love to look it up. Yeah. And I think the criticism of it is just another bit of snobbishness that like comes into mm-hmm. like the literary world that it's very, very annoying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but let me get off well, my and It's soap. also very ignorant you know, and ahistorical because if you read any novel or anything that was written, you know, decades ago, they're referencing their present moment. And it doesn't right. stop us from engaging those texts. So, yeah, that's very, very elitist, I think. Yeah. It's totally elitist. And Dickens was pop culture in his day. It was serialized. Right. It was like Vanity Fair. It was the Vogue magazine. <laughs> Everyone was reading Dickens on their couch in the newspaper. So what do you think that was? It was pop culture. Mm-hmm. Oh, and you were going to tell us what you're obsessed with now. Oh, my gosh. I'm obsessed with hacks and reservation dogs. I will never stop proselytizing (gasps) those two television shows. They are the best things. If I can find a way to work hacks into a novel set in the 1940s, I will do it. There's already a reference to The Wiz in it, so I feel like I can do it. (laughs) Love it. Watch both, love both. Um, Great, great shows. So um, Disha and I both include memories of, you know, Florida in our work. And of course, Florida is a state with a very wild kind of reputation and very rich in a literary sense. And in Heads, I feel like California emerges as such a distinctive character, too, especially in stories like the subject of consumption. What for you made growing up a young Black woman in California such rich material? Oh, California. Oh, my. (laughs) California, California, (laughs) as the OC song goes. Um, California has its own specific brand of racism, and it, it... feeds off of gaslighting specifically because it's it's very much like Canada and which this is why Canada was an interesting subject of study for me because Canada has official multicultural policy which says that there has to be a certain amount of diversity on the screen and behind the scenes which means that racism looks very different and California is very similar it promises we're different gold rush west coast but in practice that really amounts to constant denial of all of your experiences. So Mm. you will be, you won't be called the N word most likely, but you will be called many other things. Like, why is your dark, why is your bottom lip so dark? Why do you talk like that? You sure are smart for a black girl. Mm. You sure are pretty for a black girl. You sure do this for a black kid. And then they will say, Oh, that wasn't racism. Oh no, we're not like that here. We never do that. It's gaslighting a go, go. And Mm. so you're spending your whole life going, was it me or was it them? Was it me or was it them? Did I do that? Did I do that? It's a Steve Urkel mentality. It's constant. (laughs) Did I do that? (laughs) And it it really does a trip on your brain. And I'm not saying that the rest of the world doesn't do that, but it's a very, when I left California and moved to the South for grad school, straight out of undergrad, I found that Nashville's racism was a completely different manifestation. And I had feared the South my whole life because I had been told that the South was so harsh and so scary But I found that the overt racism was much easier to deal with in some Uh ways because I knew where I stood. I wasn't constantly Mm -hmm. going, did I do that? Did I do that? I was going, oh, they did that for for sure. They did it, not me. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Right. So um, California was just rife with possibilities. And then it has its own very specific brand of segregation. There's lots of color, lots of local color everywhere but not at night. And California has very specific kinds of sundown towns Mm. that, you know, have not been historicized unless you're really, really looking for that history. So it was interesting to me to write about going to this school that was all white, where people would still to this day, when I go to places and tour with this book, people are like, where did you grow up? How is that possible in California? No, not our California, Mm. you know? So still a a package of denial is, is part of the brand of the state. I'm 
curious about your very first um, short fiction publication. Do you remember the year and which story and where all of that? I think it was this Todd and I think it was Blinders Journal. And I liked them because they didn't care about any previous publications you had. So it was a great place for a debut story. And they were very kind with the edits. And it was just a really positive experience. And I think it was 2015. Okay. And do you remember opening that email or because, you know, we, we, we don't get the paper acceptances anymore. But do you remember how you felt when you saw it? I do. It was so wonderful. It, it really made me feel um, sort of justified in my MFA experience where I wasn't getting <laughs> such great feedback from my peers and was no longer workshopping things from the collection. I wasn't building a collection yet, but I was not bringing the things I really cared about to the workshop anymore. I was keeping them secret and workshopping them privately with just friends. And I was bringing something else to the workshop and to get an acceptance to a journal made me feel like, okay, I can actually do this. So it meant everything to me. Mm. Amazing. I'm curious about if you have a typical writing process or is there a way that a story typically starts for you? Is it with a character you have in mind or a situation, an image? It's usually very character and image driven at the same time. So it's sort of like a one sentence character in this situation, almost like a a elevator pitch character in this situation and a line and mm-hmm. it's very visual to me and it usually comes at an inopportune time like 2 a.m <laughs> I'm in bed can't sleep and I write it down in the notes app and then I've got the genesis of a story but it's never during my actual assigned writing time I tend to write on the days when I'm not teaching so I teach Monday Wednesday or Tuesday Thursday and then I'll write on the alternate days mm-hmm. and I have assigned writing time in the afternoon and I write for hours at a time, but news stories don't generally come then. They come to me while I'm on a bus or a train or a plane and in the middle of the night. And it's usually some sort of generated idea that is like a line from the plot and the character. God bless notes mode. Oh my gosh. I (laughs) have talked to so many writers who do this exact same thing. And I feel like I should pitch like a nonfiction book where we sort of like dig into notes mode from different like famous writers. (laughs) Do it. It It would be great. It's like all these fragments of weird thoughts and images and like half dreamt ideas. And like, I just love opening it like the next morning, you know, because a lot of times I put stuff in where I'm half asleep and I wake up the next morning. I'm I'm either like, this is brilliant or what was I thinking? (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's absolute gibberish and then other times it's brilliant. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Or it's gibberish. And then two years later, you're like, wait a minute that fits here. And then right. You have to it does. Right. Then it becomes brilliant. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how the brain can sometimes turn it into something when it wasn't anything before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nafisa, you mentioned revisions and how in revision, you know, one of the things you might start thinking about is audience. Can you take us through your typical revision process? Yeah, I'm really of the mind that revision takes a lot of time and space and that it is genuinely re-seeing the project globally and um, at a lower stakes level. So I try to give myself as much time and space as possible, and that means often shelving it for a while. Um, With the stories, some of them required really substantive revision that meant changing a focalization or a point of view. And so sometimes I cut my work up physically and print everything out and cut up the paragraphs, cut up the pages and move everything around on a cork board or a dry erase board and pen it up and shift things and then retape it and then type it up again. And that's better for me than moving it in a draft on a word processor because I can actually see Mm -hmm. spatially what that does. And that's what I had to do with the necessary changes have been made, which is interesting since that's the title. That took the most revision out of any story. I changed the point of view from first person and I changed the gender of the character from female to male. And it made a huge difference in that story. I didn't want two stories in the collection about women feuding with each other. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And when I changed him to a man, all of his grievances just seemed pettier and the stakes of him fighting over lights with this woman in his office seemed more significant and his character started to emerge for me a little bit more. With other texts, like the novel I'm working on, it depends on when I'm ready to show it to someone what the revision process looks like. So Mm -hmm. for full disclosure, Disha is my writing (laughs) partner and I'm sharing work with her and that feels really good and generative and it's helping me see a lot of things about this project. But I don't always share work in the early stages and I think that I do need to. So it's helping me learn a lot about my own revision process right now to be sharing with someone in the earlier draft process. And I'm curious, so you mentioned your revision process for the necessary changes have been made at the point where you're switching the point of view character. Did you finish a full draft of it in in the female character's point of view um, before you then changed it? Or was there a point where you said, this doesn't feel right, this isn't working, let me try this other thing? I think I finished a full draft with the female character And it felt a little too autobiographical. It felt a little bit like the voice was too similar to other things in the collection. Mm -hmm. And the shape of the story also didn't feel right that way. So I think I was anticipating that it didn't feel right before the draft was finished, but I think I had pushed through. Yeah. Just to put a a bow on the revisions question, Um, Nafisa, how do you know when a story is done? That's interesting. It's hard to know, but I think I generally know when I've written my way to the end. It's almost metaphysical. I sort of know in my spirit or in my heart that it just feels right. And it's really hard to know what right is, but there is a just sense that it feels complete and that there's something satisfying about it, that it leaves people wanting a little bit more, but that that more still is like a satisfying amuse bouche, enough of a morsel that it's not that the story itself is demanding that I give them more, but that they still feel like, oh, I wish I could have known and that it promised, it delivered on its promises, so to speak. Mm -hmm. When you were talking earlier about some of your influences, I was thinking about the common thread for some of them was where it was irreverence. And um, I also want to give a shout out to Matt Johnson. All three of us have had Matt as a workshop leader, by the way. Aww. And when I think of his work, you it's know, really great. yes. And it's like asking almost about humor in a way, which I think is something that's just naturally there or not. But do you think about irreverence in terms of, you know, some of the subjects that you write about and you write about them in ways that where you kind of slay some sacred cows and mm-hmm. poke at things that, You know, some people say we're not supposed to poke at, whether supposed to as polite or supposed to as black women. So um, as you're writing and and when you're writing, do you think about when you're being irreverent? That's an interesting question. I don't know if I've ever thought about it specifically as irreverence, though I do like that. I kind of like to think of myself as a saucy broad. I really (laughs) want that on my headstone. She was a saucy broad. But... I think I just cover the ground that I feel comfortable covering. And if that happens to be irreverent, then so be it. But I didn't set out to be necessarily irreverent, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It just came out that way. And I'm a little pleased that it did, but it wasn't necessarily intentional. Mm -hmm. Who are you a fan of right now in terms of short fiction? Um, Do you have a favorite collection or any that you've loved recently? Oh, so many. So I really loved Brian Washington's lot, Mm. especially A Leaf, um, the second story in that collection. I really loved Dantiel Moniz's Another Floridian, um, Milk Blood Feet. That's my homegirl. That's my girl. That is your homegirl, I know. (laughs) And in that collection, I loved An Almanac of Bones in particular. And of course, I loved The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so right now I'm loving a collection by Cindy Banu called Seeking Fortune Elsewhere. Mm. And it's amazing. It's I'm only on the second story, but um, the stories are really interesting. And the second story is intriguing. I can't wait to finish it tonight. So that's what I'm loving so far. I'll be on the lookout for that one. Thank you. Yeah, I had not heard great. that one. Do you have a favorite character from among your stories? <laughs> or in your new work? Oh, in the stories, I think I really like Randolph. He's just, mm. um, 
he's kind of a monster, but he's a cookie monster monster. <laughs> so when he started messing with the food, I was like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a man after my own heart a little bit. And, <laughs> and in the new work, oh, I really like all of these characters, but I think I'm especially into the the first wife, the wife of the protagonist's youth, whose name is Lally. One of the things I love is she renames herself. She does. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Her original mm. name is Cora Lee, and she changes it to Lally. For this collection... What do you wish you could go back and say to pre-publication Nafisa about, about any of it? Oh, wow. I think I would tell her to spin around three times and throw her beret in the air and you're going to make it after all. Yes! Kids. Like, <laughs> Very time of war. I love it. Yeah. And now that song's in my head. <laughs> you should sing it together. I, I would just tell her to be nicer to herself. Like, mm. don't take all of the feedback to heart that you're getting in your workshop, which was filled with some, some interesting characters. And um, yeah, you're going to be all right. Sing some Kendrick Lamar. Like, you're really going to be all right. Love that. Best writing advice. Sing some Kendrick Lamar. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. (laughs) Because if I'm listening, like, I'm going to be, you know, my writing, I'm, like, energized for my writing. Then I get up and have a dance break. Like, perfect, perfect writing advice. I love having a dance break. Dance breaks all the time. (laughs) We're going to have to turn the cameras on for that. (laughs) (laughs) My camera is broken. I can't. Lies. Lies. <laughs> but you, I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about that in terms of um, one of the many, I mean, I love you and, I, you know, I, but as a writer in the world, one of the things I love about you is how you have shown up in on social media and showing this sort of very broad writing life like you have your youtube show where you were doing things with writers and seeing you know den michelle norris ice skating things like that um just showing writers having fun and not taking ourselves so seriously and i think that does something to to combat some of the elitism that um that we were talking about earlier seeing you dressing up with your writer friends and having your dance breaks and showing people so I know I'm not the only one. That's just so heartening. And it's really encouraging to feel like, you know, writing isn't this serious, stuffy proposition. And that, you know, sometimes we just got to cut loose also. Um, So I guess I'm not asking a question. I think I'm just saying thank you. (laughs) Aw, thank you for that. That's really kind. I wonder sometimes if I'm putting a little bit too much out there and if people really would prefer just the writing. So I I do appreciate you saying that. Well, I enjoyed the total package. Me too. Me too. Oh, thank you. What's the best sentence you think you've ever written? I don't know if it's the best sentence I've ever written. I really do like one sentence from Heads, and it's from Randolph's story, The Necessary Changes. It's though he had theretofore avoided the diminutive form of his name in his new office, Randolph felt for the first time like a Randy. <laughs> and that's the opening line, right? That is the opening yes. line. Yes. <laughs> Killer, but I'm pretty killer. pleased with some. Thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty pleased with some of the new sentences in this novel. I I'm having some fun. Amazing. Well, this has been wonderful. Like I'm just smiling ear to ear. Thank you so much, Nafisa, for being with us today. This was a treat. Thank you. This was so. F- I just felt like I was talking to my friends, which I was. You and are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah. you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us. If you like what we're doing at Ursa, be sure to share this podcast with your friends. And if you'd like to support us directly, become an Ursa member by going to ursastory.com slash join. You'll help fund production of this show and keep us going. We'll see you next time.